Celtic Way Morning Briefing Live. I'm Tony Haggerty. As you can see, Celebrity Squares today. We're joined by everybody all on Sunday. I'll just introduce them. Sean Martin, at Sean Martin TCW Twitter handle, Alison McConnell and Graham McGarry. How are you guys? You all right? Everybody good? Oh, well, yeah, thank you. Right. Okay, we'll delve straight, straight into it. 2 0 defeat, Celtic out of the Europa Conference League and a 5 1 aggregate. I guess the first person will go to Graham is Graham, you were there, freezing. How was it? Any better in the stadium than it was back home? No, <laughs> no, um, probably <laughs> worse, I would argue. Um, I, I, you know, it's a strange one because mm. I, I didn't think, you know, hands up, I didn't think Ange would go with that lineup. Um, and as I'm seeing you off camera there, as soon as the team sheet landed, it was sort of. There's a kind of feeling of deflation about the place, you know. Um, so I don't think he gave him much of a chance with that lineup, you know. I think he maybe expected more from the players he did bring in. Um, but from the very get go, you could sort of get the feel that they didn't really fancy it. And it was very unlikely they were going to turn the, the tie around. So, yeah, disappointing night all in. And I've got to say, I feel for the, the kind of 400, 500 Celtic fans that were huddled behind the goal and getting yeah. battered by the wind and the, the snow and the hail. Um, in the rain last night um, to witness that because it, it did go out with a wee bit of a whimper I've got to say Yeah, Alison when you saw the team did you think the same thing? Did you think Ange is, you know, maybe had one eye on Sunday's game against the Bernie and I agree Chill Pill comes in there and says the fans deserve better Yeah, completely uh, I think it's, I think everyone was taken aback by the team lines, I think when Ange had spoken last week about saying it's only half time in the tie that we can still turn it around, and I think the only way to really have approached it was to go all guns blazing because the only way that the tie was going to flip was by a strong 15, 20 minute start. I think if Celtic had got that early goal, then that's what they needed to find a way to get back into it. I think then when you see the team line right away, you're thinking the priority now is the league. It's all, it was almost a, a concession that the game had gone, that the tie had gone. Uh, and I think overall, I think 5-1 is an embarrassing scoreline in the third tier of, of European competition. I think it highlights the deficiencies within Celtic side, especially I think in European football. Some of the performances in the Europa League were decent, were good. Uh, Celtic scored goals. But I think now, if you look at the European campaign this season, I think they've scored, they've conceded an average, possibly even higher, of, of three goals a game, you know, you're, you're not going to advance or progress in any kind of European tournament until you sort out and prioritise mm -hmm. how you how you set up at the back and how you set up in European competition in a way that plays to your sense of scoring, but also keeps you tight defensively. Sean, even from the get-go, I don't know if you noticed the TV pictures, but Neil Beaton was kind of joking with the, the referee. Just didn't see him up for a time. He was like, was freezing. <laughs> he was kind of stretching before he even... You know, and I just kind of, just the body language was, was all wrong. But do you agree that the team selection took everybody by surprise and maybe he did have his eye on Sunday and Hibs? Um, and aye, and well, let's, go with, let, let's go with team selection first then. Uh, before before I get to my possibly over optimistic <laughs> view of the whole thing, um, I, I, I made the maybe a bit naive statement to you, Tony, before the game that there was still up to about seven players that were probably first choice. So, I wasn't as defeatist as most seems to most seem to be when the lineups came out, but that I mean that said there was no getting away from the fact that he rotated out his best centre back, his best midfielder, and his best winger. Even though you could make the argument Carter Vickers and Jota were not at their best in the last match, um, Graham's already touched on it. But given so many fans made that absolute trek, I, I was a wee bit disappointed by the apparent lack of intent in that team. Um, Selecting both Rogic and O'Reilly together again, I think, is maybe going a wee bit under the radar. That was either, mm -hmm. to me, that was either being stubborn or it was giving them the chance to prove the doubters wrong. I'm, I'll probably choose to believe it was the, the latter, but I, I said I suspect it was probably the former. Um, either way, I think the depth that they added in January is looking fine for Scotland so far, but maybe still a bit away from being ready for Europe, especially, and I think this is the point to remember, especially against such a well-drilled team like Bodo were. Graham, does Celtic just lick their wounds now and go again on Sunday? And if they win on Sunday, it'll probably be consigned to the, the dustbin. People rate it as a third-tier uh, European tournament anyway. It's not where they want to be. But I'm just saying that he wants to 
to be there. You know what he wants to be in and around competing in Europe and, and playing against the best and, and testing yourself against the best. Yeah, I mean, they've no choice but to kind of move on. And that's very much what kind of Joe Hart was, was saying after the game last night. You know, you just park it. They're obviously disappointed, but, you know, you have to move on. But I think with Ange going with that team last night, it now makes Sunday absolutely critical that they win, you know, because he's clearly given that game precedence over the UEFA Conference League. Um, I know he said all the right things, and he said last night after the game as well that it still stands that he wanted to go through and he still thought the team that he put out was going to be good enough. But I think everybody knows, reading between the lines, that he's, he's obviously rested his key men for that game um, on Sunday. So now I think if he doesn't win that, he's going to come in for a bit of stick. Um, but you're right, fans kind of have short memories. And I think if they do win on Sunday, especially if Rangers drop points after that and they maintain their, their position at the top of the league, maybe a lot of Celtic fans who weren't at the stadium will forgive it. Tim Anon says this is the first year of Ange Ball judging in Europe in a year or two. That's that's a fair enough comment. Uh, and Sean Ross is only halfway through a rebuild, rebuild, but both legs well below par. And Michael Quinn comes in and says, hope the confidence doesn't start to drain out the squad. Now, Alison, since the Motherwell game, which you and I were both at, there has been a, a dip in the levels of intensity though, in Celtic's play, hasn't there? And, and, and their forum, it's, it's, it's noticeable. Yeah, I would agree. I think uh, the Rangers game and the Motherwell game were maybe the best two league performances or among the best two league performances that you've seen this season. I don't know it's be, that it's been sustained since then, but I thought that was a very interesting point that you made there about whoever uh, offered that about confidence doing. And I think uh, I think there is a danger if you don't react quickly to it of that becoming an issue. And I think the converse of that is that you look at the result Rangers had last yeah. night in the Europa League. It, you know, whatever way you look at it, it's a result that that's extraordinary against one of the favourites to go and, and win that tournament. I thought, uh, you know, they'll take tremendous belief. From that, they, they'll really draw a lot of confidence from the way they performed and played, scored six game, six goals against a, a strong Bundesliga side. And I think you have to be careful now about what comes next. I think I would agree with Graham. I think there, there's no other option but to get on with it. You have to go now and, and focus on Easter Road. And I thought one of the odd calls last night was that if the... If resting key players was, was with a, an eye on Easter Road on Sunday, then... You know, it backfired a bit too when you're introducing Callum McGregor for the the second half, and you're bringing on players that you had maybe thought that you were going to rest in the first place. I I, I thought um, I thought the team selection was wrong for the first leg, and I thought it was wrong for the second leg, and I think it just maybe offers a bit of perspective of where Celtic are at the minute. I think there's been a lot of excitement about Ange Ball and all this kind of. Uh, where Celtic are now from last season and I think some of it has po possibly been exaggerated in terms of the progress that's been made and that's not to, to say that there's not been progress that they've not improved, I think you can see the improvement but at the same time I think there remain deficiencies within the squad Sean the telling thing for me was that when Callum McGregor and Lila Vada came on in the second half, eh, they were our best players <laughs> I, I mean, you made that you made that point in your ratings, didn't you? Um, yeah. On the website. I mean, I thought I thought Celtic did perform a wee bit better after half time, and it is it was when McGregor and Abada came on. But then there was also a, a kind of slight shape change to more of a kind of four four two with the full back staying further wide, which I, I did I did think helped matters. But in saying that, <clears throat> I must admit that overall I had a kind of similar feeling to the see the second half of the Glasgow derby, but in the opposite way. In that I felt that Bodo mm. kind of said, right, we've got a cracking lead here. Let's yeah. see what you've actually got while we take a bit of a break, like Celtic did in the second half uh, at Parkhead against Rangers. So that that only the, the positives even only go so far for me um, in terms of the performance in that in that regard. No, but I was just making the point that those two coming on showed the others how it was done. Showed oh no, definitely, I the but, ball a bit better and you know get themselves up the park. I mean that 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 was I agree with Sean entirely there, Graham. Ange was setting out that team, as Alison said, probably the wrong team, but he would have expected them to carry out the game plan for more than seven minutes, would he not? Yeah, I mean, no matter what his expectations were going into the game, you could tell after the game he was really quite angry. Um, unlike Ange, you know, I know he, he likes to slap down journalists now and again, but 
he clamped down on a Norwegian boy last night, you know, like he really who asked him if, if he thought Bodo could win the win the conference league and he basically said, Look, I don't care. You know, why would I care, mate? Um and it's a wee bit out of character and it just it just kinda showed that he was really quite annoyed with what he'd saw. Um and I don't know if maybe for him as well it's been a wee reality check that maybe the depth in the squad that we've been talking about since January maybe isn't quite there uh, the way we thought. I mean, there's a lot of numbers there, but I don't think any of the guys that came into the team last night from the start of the game really did anything to give them a, a problem for, for Sunday. I think every one of the players that he rotated out will come back into the side, um, and rightly so, for that game. And I think maybe it's been a reality check for, for him about how far along the team is and, and how much depth he does have at his disposal when it comes to European competition anyway. Um, so... And I think overall, I think the, the whole European experience for him, like he said, it's really been valuable um, over the piece, but that they didn't make the impact that he wanted to. Um, and I think he wants more from his team in the continent, and I think he wants more from the French players that he's got, if you, if you want to call them that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he was really annoyed last night, and I think that kind of shows that the players he's got at his disposal maybe aren't quite there yet um, and where we thought they maybe were. Tony, awesome. the, the reason that, sorry, the, just what you say there, Graham, about him, about Ange being kind of annoyed by the by the way they played, I think that is spot on. I, I said that in my kind of piece for the website that went up this morning, that he said more than once that the way that he likes to measure how his team is progressing is by how much they impose their style on the opposition and how much they take the game to someone else. And I think that will rankle them more than, even arguably more than the result, that they were outplayed and outthought for both legs, whether it was the first team, first choice bona fide first teamers or whether it was the French players. And the fact that the French players come in and, and didn't really perform at the level that he would be expecting from an Ange Postacoglu team, that's probably why he was so annoyed rather than the actual result at the end of the day for me. Well, Frank Brennan yeah, comes away. Sorry. And was was there's no way Ange was completely wrong over two legs. That's You can debate that too when you go get him, sorry. No, I'm just going to say I agree with Sean. I think that, you know, we can talk about the team selection and I agree with the points that Alison and Sean have made that I think the team selection was wrong in both legs. Um, but I think within that, mm -hmm. Ange still expected more from his players. Um, mm -hmm. And that's ultimately what got him so upset after the game last night. Alison, he always talks about, as Sean said there, about imposing Celtic style of football on every opposition. How do Celtic put their pair, uh, pedal to the metal again, as they say? Because you can't just keep turning it on and off, can you? I think it's just about accepting where you are, what you've still got to do. I think European football is a very different entity from domestic football and domestic games. I think there's maybe there's maybe an argument to say that you compromise some of your principles when you go into a European field and you know that defensively you're going to perhaps be asked more questions than you are domestically. I think we all know the philosophy that Ange, Ange Postecoglou has brought to Celtic, you know the way he wants to play football and I think you applaud it. I think it's very much within the spirit of a, of a Celtic team. However, I think when you go into European football, I think there is a need perhaps for a, a more pragmatic approach if you want to go and, and try and compete against teams. I think, you know, you, you can applaud Bodo Glimp. I thought they played... Excellently, I think both legs they, they more than deserved the win. I think, if anything, I think the scoring, the margin of scoring could have been wider. Um, but this is a team who haven't yet started their domestic season. You know, essentially, Celtic could have been catching them cold. There was no hint of that at all over the course of both of those games. And when you look at the finances and the budget of how that team has been assembled and contrasted with Celtics, I think you can see that Celtic should be coming out of that on top. They should be prevailing. So I think you do have to go and, and take a look at things. I think you have to ask the questions. Uh, this is a, a Celtic team who have ambitions this season of winning a league that opens the door to Champions League football and the group stages of Europe's premier European competition. Now, that's not a free lunch. We all talk about the finances that that brings, that offers you scope to, to build your squad and, and bring in players and the resources it brings. But ultimately, you are exposed when you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with those kind of teams. And I think maybe there's a sobering element to the, the European campaign from July until now. 
It's a good word, that, Sean, sobering element, but you and I both agree that Celtic should be competitive on mm -hmm. the European stage. And as Alison's touched on there, the finances that Celtic have dwarf the finances of Bodo, mm -hmm. and there is prestige involved in this. So why can't Celtic be competitive on both fronts? Well, this is where I start looking at the <clears throat> more optimistic take that I've got. And... Um... I mean, I stand by what I said, what we both said, Tony, before the game, that I, I don't believe it was a case of one or the other, League or Europe. Um, I think there was enough person. There are there is enough personnel, and I thought there would be enough quality to have genuinely competed on all fronts. Last night, I think, threw up some interesting questions over tactics, for one, depth again as well. But more so, I, I think they did just come up against a better drilled and more confident team in terms of Bodo's identity and game plan. Celtic struggled. Uh, pass out of Bodo's press the way that some Scottish teams struggle to pass out of Celtic's press. To me, going out of Europe, fundamentally, going out of Europe is always a negative to me, always a negative. And it's defeatist in the extreme to consider a Celtic continental exit to be a good thing. Um, that's the way I stand on it. I think, Tony, you agree with me. Overall, in context, and I make this case on the website, plugging my article once again, if you fancy reading more of it, I think this European campaign, when you take it as a whole, has been a benefit for Celtic despite all the concessions. I think the progress made in the squad and despite what I've just said about Bodo's identity and Celtic's identity since that makeshift team were knocked out by Mitchelland, I think it's night and day. And I think there's plenty of positives to take from that Europa group stage, which was the toughest section. Alison mentioned the Bundesliga quality. Betis and Leverkusen are arguably two Champions League quality teams. And likewise, I think there are also lessons to be taken from going out to a team punching above its weight in a competition like Bodo. Um, if they heed them, like the, the lessons that I'm talking about, this European run can serve, serve Celtic well for me. Graham, do you agree with that? That it could be a learning curve, but the stats are there is 18 years, 19 years since Celtic last won a knockout tie in Europe. We have to go back to Martin O'Neill's era, and I believe that was against Barcelona in uh, 2004. Uh, then they, they, they beat Villarreal and then, sorry, drew Villarreal and then lost to Villarreal after the round against Barcelona. It's quite a woeful and shocking record really, isn't it, Graham? It is, but I mean, that's that's none of Angie's concern. I think the stat that will concern him will be the fact that they did ship so many goals over the course of those games. I think it was 27 in the in the sort of course of 14 European games um, over this, this campaign. I think he'll be looking at that more than you know, Celtic's overall record in the last 18 to 20 mm. years, whatever it may be. Um, I think he does have ambitions to be successful in Europe. And I think he does recognise that to achieve anything, he's going to have to find a way to kind of stop shipping goals um, when they come up against this level of opposition. But it's an interesting sort of debate because you also know he's not going to change his style. Um, he's very much sort of, you know, plan B is doing plan A better. And at the moment, it doesn't really seem as if the players are at a stage where they can carry that out in sort of European competition without leaving, you know, themselves exposed at the back. Um, and they've just that's been the issue for Celtic. They've just lost too many goals. I agree with Sean. I think overall, it's been a fantastic learning experience for especially the younger players in the, in the Celtic team, um, the European adventure. But I think what will be concerning Ange is that maybe some of the lessons that they did get in the sort of earlier rounds um, weren't heeded because they were still making the same mistakes mm -hmm. um, when it came to the last mm -hmm. two games against Clint. You touched upon that there, Alison, as well. It's a question or a case of Celtic is going to have to learn, aren't they? And Angie's going to have to be, as you say, possibly more pragmatic. But if he's not going to change his style, how do you marry those two together to become a successful European team? Money. <laughs> <laughs> those are a simple answer. Uh, it's about if that's the case, and it's about identifying very quality players that you think are good enough to execute that game plan against some of the elite teams in European football. So I think if we come down to reality, I think uh, you know you know where Celtic are in that kind of pecking order. I think it. I think then what you look at is various threads. It's about players that you think have the quality who can come in and perform at that level. It is about how you're tactically set up and it is also about about improving and, and trying to absorb some of the lessons. I think when you look at that tie there, that third goal 
at Celtic Park, they, they, that, that really flipped things completely yeah. just straight after Maida had had pulled one back for Celtic and then the the push to find a leveller and, and the exploitation of the space that was left at the back and, and a deflected goal. I think you could maybe lament your luck in, in that sense, but also I think it just killed the tie. It just made it so difficult to come back to. And I think maybe it's about realising you don't always have to chase and harry and press all the time in that kind of environment. Sometimes it's about playing with your head and managing a game as much as it is about going and, and trying to find the goals. I want to flick this one up again because I, I just like the name, Big Angie's Beard. Marvelous. <laughs> Seven months in, Europe has been a learning experience, no doubt. We've had a longer run than I expected this year. Next year we'll be in a position to judge. I think a lot of them think the same as well. Uh, that's been a, a cracking 20 minutes, so we enjoyed that. We could talk about this until Celtic next qualify for whatever European competition we'll be in. Uh, just wanted to say as well, you can see in the strap line at the bottom, if you subscribe, you hit the subscribe button to the Celtic way, it's a pound for two months for top quality journalism covering the club that you love. And if you hit the subscribe button, you'll get notifications for the bulletins that are on daily, Monday to Friday, with myself, Sean, Alison and Graham appearing on a regular basis. Thanks for your contribution, guys. Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Graham. Safe flight home, Graham. I'm glad you're getting Thanks, out of the cold. You look as if you do with a heat, son. Yeah, right. so, <laughs> we'll see you soon. All right, and thanks a lot, guys. And uh, on to Sunday now for Celtic. We'll see what it brings. Cheers, Tony. Thank you.